Cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF for short, surrounds the central nervous system. Produced continuously, it provides lubrication for the brain and spinal cord. It can act as a shock absorber during blows to the head, protecting the brain. In addition, the CSF also maintains constant pressure within the cranium. Adjustments in its volume depend on volume of blood and brain tissues. Another crucial function of the CSF is the circulation of nutrients filtered from the blood and the transportation of metabolic waste away from the CNS. The cerebrospinal fluid is primarily formed in the ventricles of the brain, so let's discuss those first. The four ventricles of the brain include the two lateral ventricles, one in each hemisphere, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. Let's look at their placement relative to other brain structures. Separating the two lateral ventricles is the septum pellucidum. The corpus callosum runs over top. Under the anterior horn and central portion of the lateral ventricles, you'll find the thalamus and caudate nucleus. And under the inferior horn, you'll find the hippocampus. Now, rotating our model, notice how thin the third ventricle is. On either side of it, you'll find the medial nucleus of the left and right thalami. The hole in the middle of the third ventricle is where the massa intermedia crosses between these two thalami linking them together. In front of the third ventricle, you'll find the hypothalamus. Posteriorly, you'll find the pineal gland. The fourth ventricle is snuggled into the cerebellum, and in front of it lies the pons. The CSF filling the ventricles is produced by the choroid plexus, and the only parts of the ventricular system lacking choroid plexus are the cerebral aqueduct and the frontal and occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. A plexus is a branching network of vessels or nerves. The choroid plexus consists of specialized ependymal cells surrounding capillaries. It acts as a blood CSF barrier, meaning that it blocks most substances from crossing from the blood into the cerebrospinal fluid. It also removes metabolic waste, excess neurotransmitters, and other substances from the CSF. Another important function of the choroid plexus is the production of CSF, about 600 to 700 milliliters daily, deriving it from the blood plasma. Pulsations in the choroid plexus and movement of the cilia of its cells then aid in the circulation of the CSF. The movement of the CSF is pulsatile matching the heartbeat. Now, before we get into CSF circulation, I'd like to briefly discuss the meninges of the brain. The meninges include the dura mater, the arachnoid membrane, and the pia mater. I'd like to point out a couple of features in this diagram. Note these structures, called arachnoid granulations. Arachnoid granulations project from the arachnoid membrane into the dural sinuses, allowing the CSF to enter the venous system. This unidirectional flow is achieved by a pressure gradient. Notice also that the dura mater has two layers, the periosteal layer closer to the skull, as well as the meningeal layer, which lies over top of the arachnoid membrane. Okay, first let's look at this simplified overview. CSF circulation starts in the lateral ventricles, leaving via the intraventricular foramens. The CSF travels to the third ventricle, which it leaves via the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct leads the CSF to the fourth ventricle. From here, the CSF travels through the subarachnoid cisterns, which are the spaces between the arachnoid membrane and the pia mater. Since the pia mater goes into every sulcus of the brain, while the arachnoid membrane just hugs the surface without going into the folds, there is space between the pia and the arachnoid that is deeper. The cerebrospinal fluid hangs out here until it gets pushed out through the arachnoid granulations into the dural venous sinuses due to the pressure gradient. The dural venous sinuses are contained between the meningeal and periosteal layers of the dura mater. They receive blood from both internal and external veins of the brain in addition to the CSF from the subarachnoid space. 
The dural venous sinuses eventually drain through the internal jugular vein. Okay, let's look at the CSF circulation in more detail now. Once again, the flow starts in the lateral ventricles, exiting through the intraventricular foramen. The intraventricular foramen is also sometimes called the foramen of Monroe. Next, the CSF enters the third ventricle. It leaves the third ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct and enters the fourth ventricle. Extending from a point at the bottom of the fourth ventricle called the obex is the central canal of the spinal cord. CSF also travels out of the fourth ventricle via the median aperture, also called the foramen of Magendi, and the two lateral apertures, which are also called the foramina of Lushka. The foramen of Magendi drains the CSF into the cisterna magna, also called the cerebellomedullaris cistern, while the foramina of Lushka drains the CSF into the cerebellopontine angle cistern. Again, the CSF hangs out in the subarachnoid space until the pressure gradient pushes it through arachnoid granulations to the dural venous sinuses. To review, the dural venous sinuses receive both blood from veins of the brain as well as CSF from the subarachnoid space. Let's check out some of the anatomy and how the sinuses channel their contents to the internal jugular vein. Firstly, we have the superior and inferior sagittal sinuses. These lie at the upper and lower margins of the falx cerebri, which is formed because the upper layer of the dura mater, the periosteal layer, stays put near the skull, while the lower layer, the meningeal layer, dips down into the longitudinal fissure between the two cerebral hemispheres. Similarly, the tentorium cerebelli extends into the transverse fissure, which separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum. The tentorium cerebelli is attached to the falx cerebri at its midline, and at this junction runs the straight sinus. On either side, the tentorium cerebelli encloses the transverse sinuses, which continue to form the S-shaped sigmoid sinuses. The sigmoid sinuses enter the jugular foramina, forming the internal jugular veins of the neck. Now that we've discussed some of the anatomy of the dural venous sinuses, let's examine the direction of flow. The superior and inferior sagittal sinuses flow posteriorly. The inferior sagittal sinus meets the straight sinus before both the superior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus meet the confluence of sinuses. From here, the contents flow down the transverse sinuses, continue down the sigmoid sinuses, and leave the skull via the jugular foramina, where they become the internal jugular vein. If you enjoyed this lesson, please like and subscribe. It would help me make more videos. Also, please comment if you would like me to cover a specific topic.